Welcome back to the uh, Chinese Business History webinar here at the uh, Hong Kong Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, my name is Gassan Morazin. I'm an assistant professor here, and I'm also joined today by my colleague and co-convener of the seminar, uh, Dr. John Wong. Um, so we are very happy today uh, to welcome uh, to uh, the webinar uh, Professor Carl Gerth. Uh, Carl Gerth is um, Professor of History at the University of California, San Diego, and, uh, and uh, uh, there he also holds the uh, Hui Tzu and uh, Julia Xiu Chair in Chinese Studies. Um, I think he will be, you know, his works will be well known to, uh, to most of you. He has, of course, published uh, two books, apart from the book he's going to talk about today, um, two books already on, uh, on, um, uh, on the history of Chinese consumption. First one is, of course, a China-made consumer culture and the creation of the nation. Uh, and then the second book, As China Goes, uh, So Goes the World. Uh, and today uh, he will be talking about his most recent book that takes us into the early PRC, uh, and that is titled Unending Capitalism, uh, How Consumerism Negated China's Communist uh, Revolution, and that came out with Cambridge University Press uh, last year. Um, before I hand over um, the uh, uh, mic, so to say, to um, Carl, I should just say that the format uh, of the talk is such that uh, we will first have, uh, so Professor Gerth will first talk for roughly half an hour, and then we'll have time uh, for Q&A. And uh, this is the webinar format, so please, any questions uh, that you have um, uh, for Professor Gerth, please just uh, submit them through the Q&A button in uh, Zoom, and then I will read them out in the Q&A, and uh, Professor Gerth can then um, reply to them. Uh, so, Carl, if you're ready, uh, please go ahead. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you, Ghassan, for that um, nice, very nice introduction, and also for the invitation, and John, for joining us. Um, and of course, thank you all for listening in. Uh, this last August was the 35th anniversary of my first trip to Hong Kong. And ever since then, Hong Kong has been one of my favorite pl places in the world. So I'm, I'm honored to speak here even virtually. Uh, let me set my timer and switch to share screen. Hmm, uh, there we go, share screen. Uh, I wanna share PowerPoint. Share PowerPoint. Uh, yeah, I, John or Kassan, can you see that? Yeah, it looks we okay. can see it very well. Just making yeah. sure, yeah. Okay, so great. Uh, today I'd like to ask you to consider my reinterpretation of the Mao era, that is, a reinterpretation of the history of the People's Republic of China. Uh, during the rule of Mao Zedong from 1949, the establishment of the PRC, to, until his death in 1976. For this reinterpretation, I will shift the focus from the words and events most often used to characterize the Mao era to the unfolding policy outcomes. Note just a few years different makes a huge difference in our characterizations of the Mao era. Contrast, for instance, the communist revolution in 1949 with the compromises that the party made with capitalists in the early 1950s, or contrast the great leap forward attempt to catapult the country into communism with the Gongfeng, the communist win in 1959, with the party's policy reversals of the early 1960s. In the early 1960s, the party restored some of the policies that it had just previously, a few years earlier, abolished because they were explicitly capitalist. And of course, contrast the climax of the Cultural Revolution in 1969 with the death of Lin Biao and the aftermath in 1971. In my view, popular characterizations of the Mao era often rely more heavily on radical extremes rather than another set of policies and events that directly contradict these more high profile extremes. Above all, I think the attempt to, to find a socialist China gets us to pay too much attention to say the great leap forward of the late 1950s, that is the bits that conform most to a radical socialist China interpretation and not enough to the contradictory bits of history. I think when we look at a broader range of history of the Mao era, China is more helpfully interpreted as a form of capitalism rather than some sort of exotic socialist other or a well-intended socialist project gone awry. I'll try to do 
three things in my time today. First, I'll contrast the ways we use the terms socialism and capitalism. And second, I'll discuss consumerism as the demand side of industrial capitalism. In my reinterpretation, the expansion of consumerism throughout the entire Mao era provides evidence for the underlying development of industrial capitalism. This expansion of consumerism tells a different story than the standard focus on radical policies, the Great Leap Forward, or the Cultural Revolution, or the person of Mao. Last, I'll discuss five reasons why I prefer to expand the concept of capitalism to interpret all sides of the Mao era, rather than continue to try to force everything into a socialist China framework. Of course, my opinion that the history of the PRC is a history of shifting varieties of industrial capitalism puts me directly at odds with the common framing of the era as one of building socialism. But my evidence led me to conclude that socialist China characterization is overused, seldom defined, and on closer inspection, a misleading dumping ground for seemingly anything and everything that happened during the Mao era. We usually think of the history of China since the communist revolution in 1949 as what? As an attempt by Mao Zedong and the Chinese Communist Party to, in their words, build socialism or also known in English as socialist construction. There are variations within this standard interpretation of a communist party that was building socialism. Some observers, especially social sciences, defend the history, excuse me, some observers <laughs> defend the history as a noble experiment in human liberation. Others criticize the party's attempt to build socialism as a giant failure and a justification for not trying to find an alternative to capitalism in our present. At the core of all of these variations is the idea that the party was doing something profoundly different when compared to the industrial capitalist world. Sometimes academics, uh, that's where I meant to say, especially social scientists, um, acknowledge that socialist China is not a perfect characterization for the Mao era. So some people add qualifications such as state socialism or actually existing socialism, or they invent new terms like developmental state. But more often scholars, especially historians, drop those qualifications or don't use them at all. During the Cold War and since, both the Communist Party and its enemies abroad in places such as the United States held this orthodox interpretation that China was building socialism on its way to communism. Likewise, secondary sources speak of a socialist China or even a communist China without any discussion of what they mean by these terms. Countless documentaries, research monographs, and textbooks reinforce the standard interpretation of the Mao era it seems taken for granted that whatever the party was up to was exactly the, what the party itself claimed, namely that everything and anything was quote, building socialism. By that same standard, I wondered this morning as I was reviewing my notes, perhaps everything that the US Democratic Party does must be to build democracy. I think you take my point there, or at least you understand what, what my objection is. In contrast, to the standard interpretation, I think we should interpret the history of China since 1949 through its development of state-dominated varieties of capitalism. I think when we balance, I think when we balance our histories by including all the evidence, including evidence that contradicts the standard interpretation, the history of the Mao era looks more like a history of industrial capitalism than it does like building socialism. Here's what I mean. Since 1949, the Communist Party, under constant threat of invasion, made frantic, desperate adjustments to the country's institutional arrangements to expand capitalism. Let me repeat this because this is a critical point here. Since 1949, the party was under constant threat of invasion. And because of that, it made frantic, desperate efforts to adjust the country's institutional arrangements in order to industrialize as quickly as possible. So more, the more use of markets or the less use of markets or the more or less use of state planning or the more or less use of state, uh, state or private ownership of capital do not define China as more or less socialist. These are institutional arrangements used to expand industrial capitalism. For instance, in 1961, 
we begin to see a shift back towards greater private control over capital, including land, and greater use of markets and a step back from state planning. These shifts in, in industrial capitalism are also visible in my specific research interests, state involvement in decisions over what people consumed. Sometimes, such as the late 1950s, the state attempted to exercise greater control, but in the early 1960s, state policies shifted. The state relaxed its control and allowed markets and private capital greater influence over consumption. In my interpretation, the changes to the institutional arrangements between the Great Leap Forward toward communism in 1959 and the policy reversals of 1961 are not evidence first of steps towards and then away from socialism, but rather 1959, 1961, and all other years represent more or less direct state control over capital accumulation. The underlying priority remains the same throughout, rapid industrialization at all costs. I interpret all forms of industrial capitalism in China and elsewhere as moving points on this uh, and a spectrum of state to private control over industrial capitalism. From at one extreme, a capitalism with complete state domination, to at the other extreme, a completely market-mediated capitalism. It's important to remember that neither of these ends of the spectrum ever existed in history. The English title of my book and lecture, and not the Taiwanese edition, which just came out uh, a couple of weeks ago, picture there on the right, make my argument explicit. Unending capitalism, the communist revolution aimed to end capitalism, but ended up expanding it. The policies of the communist party were continually destroying or negating its communist revolution. And this is the important part, even on its own terms. In my book, I make my case not by arguing about concepts, not that my preferred use of a concept such as capitalism is the truer reading of Marx or his anarchist critic Bakunin. Rather, I try to make the case through ordinary life, specifically the speed, of cons the speed and spread of consumerism and the implications for that spread since 1949. I recognize that it is customary for academics to discuss industrial capitalism through production and not what I see as the demand side of capitalism. In my view, the organization of production and consumption are two sides of the same industrial capitalist coin. The consumerist turn in scholarship for the past 30 plus years has shown that industrial production has always required a simultaneous industrial consumption, that is industrial consumerism. Demand, too, had to be mass produced. So rather than only or even primarily defining China through its relations of production, I focus on the relations of consumption, the distribution of the surplus, that is, who got what society created. When I say the spread of consumerism, I mean three things. First, the mass production of consumer products such as bicycles and bicycle brands like those pictured there on the right. Yeah, nobody, it's a good topic for a business history course to think, what is the social, why does a socialist country need brands? What's the goal behind that? Second, consumerism means the spread of discourses about products and popular media. Long before people could own their own mass produced things, they often started to encounter those things around them in advertising and in movies. So movies of the late 1950s helped stimulate demand that was only fulfilled in the 60s or later, seeing the pro these products all around them taught people to associate consumer products with meanings such as those in these illustrations, that this or that brand of toothpaste would give you a better smile, like the uh, advertisement on the left there, or that you needed to worry about the whiteness of your teeth to begin with. Or in the screen grab from a 1964 film, Never Forget, that having a leather jacket made one fashionable. Thirdly, consumerism means that people start, this is the important thing, we're talking about a very poor country here, so people start to create and communicate hierarchical identities through the consumption of these mass-produced things. Identities such as people with wristwatches were more sophisticated than their peers, as these women sent from Shanghai to the countryside may have thought. Notice the prominence of their, of their wristwatches in that photo. As this slide suggests, when China began to fulfill 
its first mass-produced wants, new ones came along. Just like in every other industrializing country, here the must-have items of the Mao era, wristwatches, bicycles, and sewing machines, the Sandadian uh, in the upper left corner becomes TVs in the 1980s in the upper right, a stereo and computer in the 1990s in the lower left, and a condo and a car in the, in the 21st century. This expansion in desires underlies all industrial capitalism. Again, I'm interested in the demand side of industrial capitalism. So industrial consumerism is self-expanding. Some consumerism leads to more and more and some self, and self-expanding consumerism ensure the continual growth of industrial capitalism. Consider then the implications. Continual industrial expansion requires people to have more and more needs. Industrial consumerism made mass produced products increasingly indispensable for tens of millions of people. I found countless anecdotes of people wanting and obtaining luxury products in archives, newspapers, interviews, and even internet blogs. A few, uh, a few of the way that people used watches such as those pictured here beyond telling time included, these were some of the things that came up in the, uh, in the sources that I read, as bribes for officials, as ways for farmers to store value after a good harvest, and even as rewards for parents to give their children to get them to study harder for school entrance exams. In many cases, literal social reproduction, that is the ability to find a wife and have children, depended on the groom's family's ability to obtain one or more of that sandatian, those three most highly desired items, a wristwatch, a bicycle, and a sewing machine. As China industrialized, of course, the country made more and more consumer goods, but with what implications? I think who gets what, that is how society distributes what it creates, suggests how we might characterize a society. Who got the first wristwatch, bicycle and sewing machine, then the next and the one after that and so on? Or I guess the, the corollary of that question is who got one of those things last or never got one at, at all? And what does that say about the society that we're looking at? I concluded that the Chinese Communist Party was not building the egalitarian democratic socialism of its loudly stated socialist claims. Rather, the party was building the exact inequalities associated with industrial capitalism everywhere and since the time of Marx himself. These inequalities favor urban over rural workers, factory over farm workers and mental over manual workers, plus men over women, ethnic majority, Han over minority peoples and so on. So it's pretty easy to predict and confirm that a manager in a factory in a city was more likely to get a watch sooner than uh, his, usually his counterpart, um, a say poor woman working in a farm uh, in the countryside. This unequal and undemocratic dist distribution extended the inequalities of industrial capitalism and the initial inequalities led to others. The first families, for instance, to have sewing machines had effectively a labor multiplier that allowed them to continue to increase their advantages. These inequalities were not, the, were not unintended consequences, rather these inequalities were the direct result of state policies and priorities. The state aimed to control all three aspects of consumerism that I named a few minutes ago. What was mass produced? What discourses were circulating about those things? And the hierarchical identities that people were beginning, beginning to communicate through the consumption of these mass produced things. Overall, state control was so extensive that I use the term state consumerism as a correlate of China's state-led production. Production and consumption were connected State efforts to manage demand, manage consumerism, freed up more resources for the production side of capitalism and allowed the state greater say in what was being produced rather than relying on the market. So consequently, they could focus their resources and in the industrialization on things like atom bombs rather than producing more bicycles. State control over the demand side of industrialization was so important that the party often equated extracting endless unpaid labor and the suppression of demand as socialism itself. The party did so, for instance, with what I consider to be the ethos and slogan of the Mao era, Jian Ku Pu Su, work hard and live frugally, 
In other words, give the state your labor and ask little in return. Sometimes, however, state consumerism promoted more consumption. In periodic moments, such as the early 1960s, the party also shifted those institutional arrangements that I spoke of earlier to ensure the ongoing expansion of industrial capitalism. The party needed a quick fix to the economic problems caused by the Great Leap Forward policies. For instance, in 1961, the party sacrificed the self-described socialist goals of stable prices and egalitarian distribution. Again, things that they themselves have identified as socialist. Uh, and instead they enacted distribution policies for highly sought after consumer goods and shifted from a system based on rations and queues, which better hides inequalities toward a system based on prices. Stores now sold products such as watches and bicycles without ration coupons to anyone who had the money to buy them at their newly inflated prices. In addition, thanks to the new policies in January 1961, 11 places in Beijing began to sell expensive food. By the end of the year, the number had risen to 62. Prices for the best dishes reached 10 renminbi at a time when the average urban worker earned under two renminbi per day. In 1961, these high-end restaurants served 13 million patrons. The policy reversal paid off. In 1961, the high prices the state products of, the, of these state products redirected millions of renminbi back into state coffers. Rather than seeing 1961 as a step back from building socialism, these policy reversals are neither contradictory nor particularly exceptional when framed as part of the state's unending prioritization of rapid industrialization or accumulation at all costs. I have, I have tested my reinterpretation of the Mao era with very different examples. For, in for instance, the cultural revolution of the late 1960s might at first seem to challenge my interpretation. The party and many participants intended the cultural revolution to be a major push against capitalism and consumerism. But I've tried to show in, in signature activities such as the Mao badge collecting fad when billions of badges were collected, such as those pictured here, or the Da Tuanlian student travel to revolutionary sites, and even the home ransacking by Red, Red Guards, that all of these activities that we associate with the height of Chinese anti-capitalism instead did the opposite of their intended goal. These cultural revolution activities expanded consumerism. I also concluded that we can find in China many or all of the things we associate with consumerism in market capitalist countries. As I show in various chapters, there were efforts to justify advertising, which the state regulated but never eliminated. And there was a state-sponsored promotion of fashion trends, included, including Soviet-inspired fashion trends in the late 1950s, such as the one pictured there on the right. State media promoted this fashion, including in magazines such as this one, stamped with the name of a remote town school library, suggesting just how far state consumerism reached. And the Communist Party expanded consumerism through what the party called socialist commerce. In fact, the party developed the infrastructure of consumerism in ways private capital may not have otherwise attempted for decades. It takes a lot of resources, for instance, to set up a national chain of stores. Long before private capital in the form of stores such as Walmart or Carrefour arrived in China, Communist Party policies helped create a network of bookstores and department stores in every province, county, and town. Here, here are illustrations of the two biggest and most famous department stores, one in Beijing on the left and Shanghai on the right. Unlike the slide, the vast majority of these tens of thousands of public stores in those chains carried only a few, few products. But with these stores, the party began to set up the economies of scale for mass production, distribution, and consumption. So then, similar to what the consumerist turn has demonstrated for Western Europe, and US history long before people could, it, could afford much or even before the state prioritized the production of more consumer goods, 
people had exposure to products and new ways of interacting with them, such as window shopping or browsing in these department stores. Party efforts to create a socialist commerce created unintended, but once again, entirely predictable consequences. For starters, the problems that shoppers encountered in stores became the sole responsibility and fault of the state, creating not simply an economic problem, but also a political problem. Basic problems uh, that people encountered in shopping reflected badly on the party's claims for the superiority of its socialism. Above all, the party prioritized rapid industrialization over meeting the demand for daily necessities. This priority helps explain its failures in the service sector. In other words, rather than blaming it all on socialism, you could just say that the state had other priorities like building a nuclear weapon. For instance, during the Great Leap Forward, the state uh, moved millions of men from the service sector uh, into manufacturing and replaced those men with inexperienced women, elderly and the handicapped. They explicitly had a policy of doing this. These inexperienced clerks then had to deal with shortages of products to sell, irate customers, extended working hours, campaigns to browbeat and, and campaigns to browbeat service workers into providing better service, such as the campaign pictured there on the screen right now. They also had to confront the widespread attitude that service work was demeaning. At the same time, customers faced queues, shortages, and unhelpful, inexperienced clerks. Customers and clerks alike at this time openly wondered what sort of socialism this was. I have no doubt that party theoreticians could justify any and all contradictions under the vague catch-all of building socialist China. After all, explaining away the contradictions that people were encountering in their everyday life was explicitly their job. But I don't think scholars have to follow the state's own interpretation of its history. Finally, then, uh, I'd like to discuss five reasons why I think we might want to reconsider the orthodox interpretation of the, of the People's Republic of China as building socialism. First, why not? The Cold War is over, or until recently, so we thought. It seems worthwhile to periodically reconsider our basic concepts as the Americanists have been doing with the history of capitalism for decades now. Second, in my experience, framing China around the concept of ever-shifting varieties of industrial capitalism fits all of the historical pieces together by explaining previously contradictory evidence. In other words, stuff that had seemed like out of the ordinary or contradictory, like the early 1960s, makes complete sense when you put it within this framework. That is, it, uh, that this framework helps explain both the Cultural Revolution as well as the reversals of the early 1960s and all the other contradictions between what the party said it was up to versus what the reality was like on the ground. This isn't, of course, where I first started. At first, I followed the standard practice of trying to interpret everything and anything that occurred in China during the decades after 1949 as part of this building socialism. I even considered labeling what I saw as socialist consumerism, something I now see as an oxymoron. Why not? Uh, the party itself had claimed to have a socialist advertising, socialist commerce, socialist commodities, socialist profits, and probably even socialist dim sum, though I haven't seen that. I've seen the previous ones used, but not that. But so many things didn't fit into the standard socialist China interpretation. After I decided a varieties of capitalism interpretation made better sense of my material, everything began to fit together more easily. I also felt reassured about using my own version of the capitalist framing after finding so many primary and secondary sources from that time, from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, both inside and outside of China, that was leading to similar conclusions about what was going on in China. As a reminder, there is a hundred plus year history of interpreting the Soviet Union and all other self-proclaimed socialist countries as forms of capitalism. So the socialist China interpretation has always been contested. Those criticisms provide a very different and for my material, more convincing way to comprehend the Mao era. I prefer a history of China since 1949 that includes a wider range of people and evidence. 
and inconvenient parts of the history of the, from a socialist interpretation make much more sense when we view, see China's Chinese state policies as repeatedly shifting back and forth along that spectrum of state to private varieties of capitalism and consumerism. Those shifts did not end with the death of Mao in 1976. So my approach also helps address a major historiographical and political question. What happened in the years after Mao died in 1976? Did the Communist Party abandon socialism when its theoreticians touted market socialism and socialism with Chinese characteristics? Should we still interpret China as a form of building socialism as the party still claims? though their time frame has shifted from months away in 1959 to centuries away for the achievement of communism. I think it makes more sense to see China not as abandoning the communist revolution only in the 1980s when Deng Xiaoping supported extended, ex expanded use of markets for products and labor, rather Deng and his successor simply shifted the institutional arrangements to again facilitate an unending expansion of capitalism. That is, Deng made bigger and longer lasting shifts than those attempted in the early 1960s. Scholars usually express skepticism at Deng Xiaoping's 1982 framing of state policies that we still see today of socialism with Chinese characteristics. We usually see that phrase as thinly veiled justification for what has been called privatization with Chinese characteristics. I think we should apply the same skepticism to earlier attempts by the Communist Party to call anything and everything building socialism. Thirdly, I also question the socialist China interpretation because the old communism versus capitalism binary focuses on what states and political elites on both sides of the Cold War wanted people to think. When we look closer, we find people had doubts over what the Communist Party was actually building. I found people at all levels of Chinese society who picked up on the contradiction between socialist words of egalitarianism and democratic control over the surplus and capitalist policies leading to ever more inequalities. So the sources led me to my interpretation. We can debate the meaning of the concepts of capitalism and socialism in our present, but I also wanted to know what people thought at the time. The socialist China interpretation often assumes that people thought whatever the Communist Party was up to was socialism. And of course, the state sources insist that was socialism. Sure, some of the beneficiaries of state policies likely thought so, such as those who got those first wristwatches or those who worked as the labor aristocracy in state-owned factories. And given the party control over mass media and education, undoubtedly, countless others must have thought, well, gee, this is what building socialism looks like. But I encountered pervasive doubts, and these doubts led me to question the standard interpretation. Uncovering such doubts helps counter the assumption of the standard interpretation that Chinese people on the street, no matter what the political economy was telling them, thought they were building socialism. Sometimes the actions of people conveyed their doubts. Workers who went on strike in factories or workers who conserved their labor power at public factories only to later sell their labor power in private factories. And we see the usual weapons of the highly exploited rural weak, hiding, eating, and stealing grain. All of these actions express doubts. At other times, those doubts were explicit, such as when Mao told the famous American journalist Edgar Snow in 1965 that the children are, quote, negating the communist revolution and restoring capitalism. Scholars who use the socialist China interpretation then are not always just uncovering and honoring the lived realities or ontology of ordinary people who thought this is what building socialism is. My concern is that we may not be squeezing, that we may be squeezing the experiences of the Mao era into, in, into, an, in, in, into an interpretive box, a box originally constructed by states and the powerful. Fourth, expanding our understanding of the varieties of industrial capitalism to include state-led varieties contributes to newer understandings of capitalism, and here's how.
Regardless of the specific year, very little of Ch China any time in the 1950s, 60s, or 70s looks anything like what like many people think capitalism and consumerism should look like. But capitalism always varies, yet there's one aspect that remains constant. Capitalism always requires fresh, free inputs, an environment to raid without consequence, unpaid care work done inside homes, mostly by women and, and girls, enslaved peoples, and of course, new places to subjugate and integrate. These free inputs supposedly outside of capitalism have always been necessary to produce a more orthodox variety of capitalism in the metropole. Global capitalism forced and continues to force China to prioritize growth, including technological growth in the form of weapons over everything else. The ruthless competition of global capitalism forces China to sacrifice any aspirations of building a democratic workers socialist paradise. These global pressures help create the state-led and non-market features we see in all latecomers to industrial capitalism. Ignoring these non-market parts of capitalism, that is the free inputs, ignores what allows capitalism to continually expand. Broadening our understanding of capitalism to include non-market features, for instance, allows us to discern these free inputs I try to broaden capitalism to include its other half, demand and consumption. From this perspective, we can much more readily see the unfolding of the inequalities of industrial capitalism. Fifth and finally, the climate crisis. We know that the endless expansion of capitalism or growthism is killing our biosphere. Good history already includes the analytical categories of race, gender, class, and, and ethnicity. But contemporary history must now include the climate crisis and its existential threat to humanity. To understand the challenges of addressing the climate crisis, we need to understand capitalism and its global prioritization of growth, even over human survival. I don't think it helps to understand our world to exoticize an intercapitalist rivalry by framing China since 1949 as a grand but failed attempt to replace capitalism with socialism. Rather, we may learn more about how to reform or replace capitalism and save our planet by focusing on the growth and consumption imperatives that lie at the heart of all forms of industrial capitalism then and now. Uh, thank you for your time and your interest. I look forward to our discussion. Hey, Carl, thank Let's you so much for- pen ready. I guess I'll unshare my screen, right? Sure, I can. Oh, I'll show you that, one last. Yeah. One last picture a friend made for my birthday. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much for for that um, for that wonderful talk. Um, uh, as I said at the start, um, we have now time uh, for questions. So if you have any questions for for, for Professor Goeth, please uh, submit them uh, through the Q and A button in Zoom, and then I can read them out uh, for um, uh, for Professor Goeth to uh, 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 reply to. Um, but I thought I could um, start us off maybe. Um, by asking you, obviously, this is so. In this book, you're sort of looking at consumerism in the PRC, uh, but your previous books have sort of looked at consumerism, sort of in more recent times or contemporary China, one could say, and uh, in the Republican period. So I wonder whether you could say a bit more as to how you sort of situate um, consumerism in the PRC and the longer development of consumerism in in modern China since the Republican period. Uh, wow, great question. I could probably spend our whole entire Q&A sure. talking about, about this. So um, I think I hinted at the end of China Made what I thought what I was going to, th that this project is sort of, you know, whatever, 20 years later or something, the fulfillment of what I hinted at, namely that there are all kinds of stuff that the state wanted to do at pre-1949 in order to regulate consumption and demand in the interests of the state suppress the desire for frivolous things uh, and, and therefore capture more of what is socially produced so that they could spend on things like defense, like building an atomic bomb or at least anti-aircraft, a gun so they could shoot down the aircrafts that were napalming Mao's uh, eldest uh, child, his son in, uh, in Korea. Um, so what I see, what I see that the, the, how I see the two related China made uh, leading up until the wartime and then what happens after 1949 is that the state is finally powerful enough to regulate consumers or organize consumption in ways that serve state interests. 
um, somewhere in the book, I even call this uh, our reserve army of consumers uh, to mirror the reserve army of um, workers uh, required for um, industrial capitalism. Um, yeah, I could elaborate on that, but I want to make sure, sure I get the other questions or we could come back to that if you'd like. Yeah, there's no, so many things yeah. that, that sort of follow from that. Of what happens when the state can go like this and, and start to organize things in the ways that it finds helpful. One other elaboration on that, 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 that I want to quickly make that came up very briefly in the talk is, is that sometimes increasingly towards the end, and especially by the 70s, the state no longer needs to suppress consumption. It needs to stimulate consumption. As China industrializes, it's unsurprisingly that it'll have, start to produce too many of things that they'll have the same problem that every other industrial capitalist country has. It'll have a supply glut and it'll have to figure out ways to stimulate uh, consumption, not just endless, endlessly suppress it the way that maybe we sometimes assume about the Mao era. Uh, but we can come, we can return to any of these themes afterwards. I want to make sure. Sure, we we'll see maybe that, yeah. well, that might come up in some of the questions as well. Um, all right, so we already have our first few questions. Um, to start off, maybe I can take these together. So we have two questions from Andrew Lee. Uh, he first asks, uh, what do you think drives the shift from state to private or backward? And um, the second question here is, I think this is... Uh, uh, so he, he's, talk, he, he, he's saying, what is your comment on the slogan, uh, socialism does not mean being poor, which I think, if I'm not mistaken, is from Deng Xiaoping. So, yeah. I wonder whether you want to comment on that at all. Wow, that could come. Yeah, so all, all super interesting questions. Um, yeah, what drives the state uh, from, uh, from state ownership on the one hand of capital or state planning to use of markets or, or use of private uh, capital. Um, I guess it, it runs into these problems that we just described earlier um, with the Great Leap Forward, and it needs to figure out a way to get people to work harder. So periodically, uh, just using lots of slogans doesn't work. Um, you have to stimulate uh, desire. Fortunately, as I said, the state advertising in the form of movies is starting to um, get people to want more and more stuff. So when they switched in the early 1960s to those policies of, okay, we're gonna charge more, but we're going to um, get rid of the need to have rations to buy some of these things, then all sorts of money that have been generated by the underground um, or gray market in China. I call it a gray market in my book rather than the black market because it's it means it's tacitly, it, they look the other way and know it exists, but it needs to exist in order for, for um, the economy to actually function. So yeah, I think they shift back and forth along that spectrum in order to, uh, in order to keep keep their economy humming and growing. You can see the same sort of thing now, or, or to respond to threats. Uh, the second question, Deng Xiaoping doesn't mean it's poor. Yeah, so uh, oh, I'm sorry, I've, I've, I can't seem to find where that's worded. What's the, the exact quotation is socialism doesn't mean being poor. Yeah, well, sorry. it doesn't, yeah. you know, th that's a great corollary to xian rang yi bu fen fu qi lai, you know, the famous other quote of first some people are going to get wealthy. Um, you're essentially saying, you're essentially reconfiguring what you mean by socialism to say, oh, gee, it actually means massive forms of inequality. It means that we're going to exploit the bejeepers out of the countryside in order to facilitate better lives for people in the cities, which is exactly what they did. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, by that definition, anything, you know, I guess they prove it. If you take all their different uses of the term socialism and you put them in a pile, you'd, you'd have virtually every definition every sort of definition out there. So yeah, they increasingly would turn to a measure our society by the wealth that's created and don't pay attention to who's paying the cost of that. We see that down to the present right now. We're just supposed to trust, or if you're a member of that society, you're just supposed to trust that 100 years from now, it will all even out. <laughs> that's, you know, that's, that's not a classic definition of socialism. Yeah, thank you. Um, the next question comes from Yang Yi, uh, and the question is, uh, dear Professor Goeth, uh, thank you very much for sharing. Could you explain uh, a bit more about the state's motivation to build state consumerism? Um, 
Yeah, I sort of hinted at that periodically at times. So if, if I were a, a more clever writer, I would have started with that anecdote that I just said briefly a minute ago, uh, that Mao's son is killed at the Korean War because China can't shoot down the American bombers that are dropping napalm. Um, that to me is really critical, would have been a very critical way to start the book, because that says no matter what sort of socialist aspirations they have for the sort of egalitarianism, worker control, all the other things that you associate with socialism, they have to set that aside and prioritize industrialization, including technological innovation and development at all costs. So for me, this what I mean by state consumerism is the state interference in all three aspects of that consumerism that I mentioned before. So what's maybe a helpful way to explain this is what do I see as the opposite of state consumerism? Well, the opposite of state consumerism is market or private consumerism. Just the, that same spectrum that I have for capitalism applies to consumerism as well. So here the state is intervening in what's being produced. It's saying, well, you may want a wristwatch, bicycle, and sewing machine because you have this desire to get married and have children. We need to be able to shoot down American bombs that are napalming our leaders' children. Um, so they would intervene in what is produced, but then they would also intervene in what sort of discourses or what sort of discussions were being circulated about what people wanted. And they'd also try to intervene and, and try to make it seem like they weren't creating this hierarchical society because they knew they would have a pretty intensive contradiction on the one hand. As it, so that's why you see, for instance, those periodic even before the last couple of decades, a periodic chastising by Mao and others of officials who have wristwatches, bicycle sewing machines, better qualities of life. They don't want that hierarchy being obvious to everyone that China was creating a class uh, that was better, uh, uh, better off than everybody else. Uh, so state consumerism then was this attempt then for the state to control the surplus, the state to control what sort of language was being uh, circulated about what those things were and, and the identities that were being circulated about what it meant to consume those things. So that's what I mean by state consumerism. And likewise, yes. I'd just add just at the end, that last little bit of that, that also means while most of the PRC, it meant suppressing desire for stuff or channeling it into useful things. Wristwatch, bicycle, and sewing machine are labor multipliers, so useful things eventually for people to want, unlike, say, I don't know, truffles or caviar or something else that people might otherwise want. So state consumerism doesn't mean just suppressing consumption entirely. It also means channeling it into something that serves state ends. Yeah, thank you. Um, the next question comes from Louise Edwards, and she asks, uh, within your unending capitalism framework, did you notice any particular ways that women and men were presented differently as consumers or targets of state programming? I'm thinking about the common and flawed line that pre-1978 years were marked by gender erasure, quote-unquote, and women's, quote-unquote, natural consumer urges were unleashed post-1978. Uh, your examples of the leather jacket and the summer frock suggested that the vanity of men in dress, for example, was not uh, ignored. Yeah. Um, well, let me just speak generally for a moment here. I think that once we, once we expect to find these differences rather than expecting gender erasure and all of that other stuff, that we'd find lots more of it. So rather than assuming an ontology, assuming everyone was living in this you know, egalitarian blue ant world or whatever, uh, then we'd find that sort of uh, diversity. We'd find those hierarchies being created by people who have access to things and people who don't. So um, yes, unsurprisingly, in, in work such as Sun Peidong's terrific book about fashion during the Cultural Revolution, you see exactly uh, what you're suggesting here, that both men are separating themselves from women, but more importantly, women who are connected are separating themselves from women who aren't. Um, you can see that pretty clearly in the Cultural Revolution in the PLA uniform fad, or even the, I mean, I, I forget how much of this ma uh, made it into the final version of the book, but virtually every aspect of the outfits that people wore during the Cultural Revolution or Red Guards were, wore had hierarchy. So what sort of, uh, uh, I guess you can see it in this video, what sort of armband you had, uh, whether your PLA uniform, which became trendy for Red Guards to wear, uh, was given to you by your parents who were PLA members. So I see a lot of the separation by class or connectedness, uh, social relations r rather than between men and women. But of course, 
you see that with men and women as well. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, the next question comes from our colleague, Pete Millwood. Uh, he says, thanks for the talk. Uh, your evidence is very thought provoking. Um, I wondered a little, or he says, I wondered a little about the causation behind your argument. Are you arguing that Chinese leaders and the party state were consciously creating consumerism in the PRC? Or did this occur in spite of attempts to build socialism from above? For example, uh, your, your example of the Cultural Revolution, was ransacking homes intended by the state to redistribute uh, products? Or was this a byproduct of the actions of Red Guards on the ground? Yeah, excellent question, as they, as they really all are. Um, yeah, so I, I, I guess the, the shortest way or most direct way to answer that question is to refer back to what I said as consumerism is the demand side of production. And both of them are parts of industrial capitalism in China and everywhere else. So they were going to get, they were going to get and need consumerism. As I alluded to with the last question, they would eventually, once they built those anti-aircraft guns or whatever else they had prioritized as a part of industrialization, they would need their popu population to start riding bicycles so that they could uh, have more specialized uh, work so they could get around to do work or again as labor multipliers have sewing machines as wristwatches for all, uh, all the other technological development that occurs during this time so i see it as an as a natural obvious outcome that occurs everywhere as they industrialize as you industrialize you need people to start wanting the things and you need them especially this is, goes back to that consumerist turn that i spoke of earlier uh, that looks at early the early modern uh, european world the assumption was that if you build it they will come if you make it they will buy it Uh, but what that turn did was say no uh, that people won't automatically exchange uh, time for trinkets or things and that uh, you needed to get people to shift from wanting to have more of their time to wanting a new kinds of things and i think that that wanting new kinds of things the development of consumerism then was had to had to occur, occur for them to achieve uh, their industrial am ambitions so yeah, not consciously creating consumerism. Uh, as I so sort of say, they try to slap the label socialist on all the things that were occurring out, uh, 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 around them, even though they, they knew that it was so a little bit of consciousness and that they knew that it was creating these sort of inequalities, but they you know, tried to address them or state that they were addressing them or promise that they would take care of it in the next you know, couple hundred years or months, depending on what point in history you look at. The second part of the question was, or did occur uh, from uh, build socialism from above see yeah i don't use the term build socialism really much at all because whenever i see the those policies of egalitarianism or democratic control over the surplus or worker run workplaces as a way of getting more efficiency and all of those other kind of things i see whenever that runs into the imperative to grow as quickly as possible all of those kind of policies get crushed Uh, you see that in the Great Leap Forward with the funding very temporarily of, of childcare, and then they run out of money. And next thing you know, women are expected to bear the double burden of working in those stores in those terrible conditions and taking care of their children at the same time. So again, I don't, yeah, that's why I don't use the term building socialism. It's, it's a, you know, Lots of aspirations. I'm sure incredibly, a credible number of well-intended people who want to, to square that circle, but it was ultimately unsquareable, if that, if that works, um, in that their highest priority was to uh, compete in this global capitalist system. Um, so that last example, ransacking of homes intended by the state to redistribute uh, products, um, or was this a byproduct of actions of the Red Guards Uh, it's probably some of both we had seen in the 1950s in the San Fan Wufan campaign that they would in, periodically say there's a lot of a lot of riches that are hidden away and we have to get that from those people um, because it's a source of their own wealth it's a source of any in local inequality uh, envy and so on so I would say it's probably see uh, both of those uh, things off the top of my head I guess you'd have to look at the specific ransacking but yeah just to elaborate on that, that example a little bit so plenty of examples 
again, those blog posts in my book, you can look up www and you find the blog post that I use and I archived it wherever it says archived. It means I archived it online so that you can go and read it for yourself. And so many of these red guards talked about that these ransackings, you know, open their eyes to what sort of splendors they themselves want. So all of them talk, you know, they're famously wearing those lots of different wristwatches that they've confiscated, but learning about the high brand hierarchies from going into these homes. And lots of these pro products were stolen and then redistributed um, you know, throughout uh, local communities. So they had a way of uh, circulating a lot of these luxury products that otherwise they wouldn't have had. So yeah, it raises people's awareness and their ability to begin differentiating because they, again, get to see citizen watches and other kinds of brands that have become scarce by then. Yeah. Um, the next question comes from Felix Lai. Uh, it's quite a general question. So he asks, uh, is excessive saving a big socioeconomic issue in China? Well, but I don't know whether you want to talk about that. With I would just to say- your topic I, I just, yeah, it's a good excuse for me to plug my website. I should put this on academia.com. But in my website, I have the, all the versions of my books. I'll have the latest one there soon. You can find it online. If you can't, email me and I can get you a copy of it, a digital copy of it. And you can look at this in my sec second book. In my second book, As China Goes, So Goes the World, I talk about how the world is, world meaning the West, meaning the United States, is demanding that China save the planet in two simultaneous and contradictory ways. The one way to do it is to, as this person's alluding to, stop saving so damn much and start spending, especially spending on imported products so that China could drive another wave of global economic development and make sure that I can retire on time because I need our, my retirement account has to earn 7% to say solvent or something. Uh, so on the one hand, China needs to do its part to consume, to continue to emulate um, American um, economic development strategies by having a high consumption, low saving society. But on the other hand, they're somehow magically supposed to do that without uh, creating massive uh, global um, problems, most notably uh, climate change or climate warming or global catastrophe. Uh, so yeah, you could say from an economist and um, uh, neoclassical economics point of view that it's been a huge problem under consumption in China has been a huge problem for a while. But uh, I would just add like, yeah, what if China had been driving this many cars as, as it's now driving for 20 more years and it's been driving or you can kind of follow that through. What if they had been consuming as much meat per capita as the United States? And you can go, go through all of that and think of the climate um, change repercussions, not to mention the domestic environmental repercussions of all of that. So yeah, it's a, it's a mixed bag wishing Chinese would consume more. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, because you just mentioned climate change. So uh, the next question from Sai Zhang uh, asks exactly about that, whether you can talk a bit more about the, uh, I guess the fifth conclusion that you mentioned uh, at the end of your talk, um, how this all connects to, uh, to the climate crisis. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I've got somebody sure. I, I actually asked me about that. In some way, you could say it's just a, a nod to what we all have to realize that, I mean, really, if we're, we're going to talk about economic development or social change in the 20th century or whatever, I, I think it has to be with our contemporary predicament in mind. And I don't think if we look back to China as a golden age for alternative to capitalism, um, we're going to do ourselves any service in figuring out how to avoid what is at the heart um, of the problem of capitalism today. That is the imperative to grow, to keep growing no matter what. And as I've said, that corollary is not just growing for the sake of growing, it's consuming at the same time. You need people to constantly, you know, making more cars, but consuming more cars, making more cars and consuming more cars, making, you know, generating more oil, fracking more oil, consuming more oil, and, and so on uh, down the list. So if we look back to that as a golden alternative, um, and rather than as a, a critical part of global capitalism, one that looked weird because it was on the margins compared with the metropole, but one that was still part of this global system that was forcing China and every other uh, country, latecomer industrial country to participate in this system. Then we kind of realized that we're, we can't kind of look to China or anywhere else in the contemporary world for a silver bullet or a magical solution to the predicament that we're in. 
something, you know, going beyond capitalism, or at least a capitalism that isn't going to finish the planet, we haven't seen great alternatives yet, or at least on the scale um, that we need them to appear. Mm, yeah. Um, and then probably a final question, um, unless there's, uh, you know, anyone else has any further questions um, from uh, Peter Hamilton. Um, and he says, thanks for the stimulating talk. Um, in your argument, is capitalism synonymous with all forms of capital accumulation and industrialization? All forms of capital industrialization that prioritizes accumulation industrialization as an end goal. So if China had done what it said it was going to do with socialism and empower workers and get more efficiency that way, then fine. But every time those experiments of worker empowerment that they would be in charge of their labor and what happens to, to their labor, the fruits of their labor, um, every time they experimented with that as a way of gaining more efficiency, when, it, when that ran into problems or when they needed more uh, work, they, took, they, they disbanded or crushed those experiments. So yes, Theor theoretically, there's a possibility of having industrialization that doesn't create a system in which you have self-expanding uh, um, compulsory industrialization like you've seen in the world you know, throughout the 20th and into the 21st century, then maybe there is an alternative uh, version of industrialization. But for me, industrial capitalism is what everything uh, was in the 20th century. There was no, there was lots of theoretical alternatives to it, but nothing that was being done in practice based on all of that stuff that I mentioned earlier, both in the talk and in the Q&A, summarized by that anecdote about Mao and, and, his, and his napalmed son. About, like, there we are in 1950, I think it was, when he, we were at this crossroads, maybe we're going to do all these sort of, maybe we're going to put theory into, into socialist practice or something. But when you're faced with that sort of global order, and you're faced with the compulsion that China starts to need to trade in order to feed its population, or in order to technologically innovate enough to shoot down those planes, that creates all sorts of knock-on effects that forces China to to act in a slightly different way from industrial capitalist countries everywhere. Those slightly different ways, I think, were summarized by that spectrum of state to private that I said. The differences with China's industrial capitalism was there was much more state involvement, just like you see in every latecomer, uh, a late coming, uh, latecomer industrial country, much more state involvement and much more state control over capital. So for me, who owns capital, whether it's private or state, or how how capital is allocated is less important than what Peter's question suggests is that capital accumulation is prioritized above everything else. If I can chime in here for a little bit and, and keep you for a few more minutes, Carl. Um, you, you have done such a good job with uh, getting us to rethink all these categories, capitalism, socialism. I wonder if we can do it also with uh, consumerism uh, or consumption in general. We should think about that more as using something up but then the, the acts that you are describing seems to be more the uh, possession thereof, the purchase thereof, of, of something. Um, it, it, the watches don't seem to be used up, um, you know, nor do many of the items that uh, seem to have popped up in different uh, points in time. I wonder if actually it is, I mean, except if you think about it as symbolic capital, which, you know, is not specific to the China case, but then the China case is uh, more acute that way because as you show so powerfully for the different years, there's a channeling of the mindset to certain items. So I wonder if, you know, it's just consumerism or is it more investment of sort because they, you convert, you know, your power into cultural and social capital. I mean, it's a distinction that's tough to make even on the capitalist side of the world, you know, how much of a house is investment versus consumption. But in this case, because of the limitation of the items that one can have under private ownership, I wonder if there is more of an acute sense of what we what we cons consider to be consumables or consumer consumption items, uh, you know, taking on more of an investment sense in uh, the PLC and during especially during the Mao's era. Yeah, sorry, I'm not qu quite sure uh, that I follow your question. Um, I, I followed that it's about the concept of consumerism and what it means and whether we can expand it to include other kinds of 
uh, other kinds of things that people are quote unquote consuming when they're buying and possessing things. But that's, uh, that's certainly what I meant. That's why, that's why I don't use the term. I've, I've been asked lots of times and wasn't asked this time about why don't you just use consumption? Why don't you call it socialist consumption or just narrow it down to just using things rather than consumerism. And I'm like, no, it's, it's, as I said, it's, it, it, it is part of capitalism. And therefore as part of capitalism, it's a lot, it's about, as you're, as I understand your question, it's about a lot more than just getting and acquiring something. It's about, for instance, demonstrating that you're more sophisticated because you're from a city and you have a watch or that you're a cadre uh, and not a non-cadre or that you're you know smart enough uh, and sophisticated enough and wealthy enough to know the difference among the 20 different brands of watches uh, uh, that they have available at that time so it has all of these other um, connotations to it beyond just simple uh, consumption it means that you, it means as that last third um, Thing that I had. So it's about mass production, circulation of all of these ideas about it. And it's about the creation of these hierarchical or different sort of identities through it. And those different identities through it through, comes through the consumption, not just of the thing, but of all the associated meanings that, that are attached by those things that you're mm -hmm. sophisticated, that you know the difference between this or this or that brand or everything else that we associate with it. But if I, if I didn't guess correctly, John, you can uh, re repost no, no, it. No, I, I, I agree with what you're saying and I, I, I get what you are saying. I guess my, my only additional bit is that then it starts to take on a certain investment mentality to it. You know, I, I buy certain things because it, it makes me uh, more productive in certain ways. Um, so it's not just our, I, I think that's the distinction between what you call consumerism versus consumption. Um, that, that, that is something that's powerful in this case. Yeah, I mean, the, the, my favorite example of all the ones that I briefly provided, I mean, I have endless numbers in the books and you know, the book was 400,000 words when I finished it. And it's mercifully, you know, 120 or something now. So endless numbers of examples because I wanted to show across so many different realms of social life, whether it's cities or countryside or anything else, that they were starting to take on all these different kinds of meanings and that people were looking to them, not, not for the intended effect, like not to ride a bicycle, but to be able to get married or to be able to get married without losing face that face face that you're marrying someone who couldn't supply any of the Sandajian and that you must come from, you know, you don't know how to work the system. So having a Sandajian item said, you know how to work the system, you know how to stand in line or use the homer, the back door in order to get something. It had, it has, as you're suggesting, all of these other meanings. And what are all these other meanings? Do they reaffirm the idea that China was building socialism, that they were transitioning to something radically different? Or as I was suggesting, if we look from the angle of consumerism and consumption, we see these inequalities multiplying like crazy through how things are being distributed, how people related to the social product, not whether they own capital or not, or you know how commodified labor was, or all these very old fashioned definitions of capitalism, but rather what what was the relationship to what was being produced in society and what sort of society was being produced by that? Was there a separate group of people who were responsible for collecting and allocating? Yes, there was in cadres. We see that down to the present. So yeah, we can. And as I was suggesting, this literature has been around for a while. I, I, it'd be a great project to figure out why it had been forgotten. Um, I know that both sides, just like what I'm experiencing now, both sides, both the China is wonderful and the China is evil back from the Cold War, hated this this alternative this sort of alternative saying actually it is a form of capitalism um the form of capitalism that they called state capitalism then but if we look at that kind of literature they have all sorts of ways that sort of helps as i say square this circle um and you could either look at it theoretically or you all, everybody gathered here who's interested in prc era history can look at their own sources and see and see and judge for themselves instead of assuming they thought her building socialism look for the contradiction um look for the uncertainty the doubts and wonder well what, what's generating those doubts everything's not per perfect in a poor country that's trying to build socialism overnight no there's a, you know, a gap between what the state says it's doing and what they're experiencing. I mean, I show that, I give, give lots of examples of that. And my favorite example is, is, is from the Jiu Ping, the ninth polemic uh, 
against the Soviet Union. I argue that it's, they're not really criticizing the Soviet Union. Mao isn't criticizing the Soviet Union. He's describing exactly the capitalist restoration that he sees occurring in China. In other words, he's giving them the language, using state media to give them the language to criticize everything around them. And lo and behold, in the Cultural Revolution, that's what they exactly what they do. They go out and criticize exactly what they've been taught. So they've been taught these doubts were introduced by the state itself. That's why I say that they negated their communist revolution on their own terms too, not just my you know, random arbitrary definition of these terms by their own terms. Yeah. Thanks, that's a, that's a powerful message. Yeah, like I said, my, my takeaway for the people that are still, uh, who have stuck around is just kind of contemplate this for yourselves. So kind of look at the material and see if this is a better way of understanding. Don't worry about the chapter and verse crowd who may not agree with my use of precise terms. Does it, does it make sense to you of what you see going on at this time? Does it uncover and connect things that previously you had to sweep under the rug? or say it was a step back from the socialist project or whatever it is. Um, I, I just found in my 13 plus years of doing research on this, that I went from, why, does it, why am I seeing all this stuff? This doesn't make sense. This is a contradiction. This shouldn't be occurring to saying, oh, when I start to look at it from this point of view, the development of a variety, a very different from the West variety of capitalism, that everything begins to fall in place and make a heck of a lot more sense. And I'm no longer trying to square circles. They're, they're just all circles or they all sort of fit together. That's wonderful. Um, unless there are any final questions, what uh, remains for me, for me to do then is to uh, thank you again, Carl, for taking the time to, uh, to talk to us and, and to uh, answer so patiently all of our uh, questions. Um, uh, before we say goodbye, I should briefly just plug our next talk in the series, which will be on the 15th of uh, October, when we will have uh, Dr. Meng Zhang of Vanderbilt University, and she will talk about her new book on uh, timber markets in Qing China and the, uh, 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 and the commercialization um, of that in uh, Qing China. So please stay tuned for that. Um, but then again, once more, thank you very much, Carl. Uh, and I hope and thank you all for tuning in. And I hope to see many of you um, doing our next uh, webinar. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank, thank you, you all so much. I appreciate the time and interest. Thank you.